I've spent a lot of time playing Minecraft. It's a game that I've enjoyed for many, many years, and at this rate, we'll continue to enjoy on and off for many more. As many hours as I've spent playing Minecraft, I think I've spent even more time with Blender. Both Blender and Minecraft allow you to go crazy with your creativity, and both can be used to make some really cool stuff. In particular, Blender has geometry nodes, which, in a way, is a lot like redstone in Minecraft. They both have a bunch of small components that can be combined into super complex projects. My first intersection of Blender and Minecraft came a few years ago when I made one of my first Geometry Nodes projects, World Generator, which uses nodes to create Minecraft-like terrain. About a year later, I made an updated version with more stuff. Both of these are available for free with the links below. I always thought it would be cool to make World Generator into a playable game, but it wasn't until recently that I started my newest project that uses geometry nodes to turn Blender into a game engine that this dream became a lot more possible. So that's what this video is about, using my game engine to make my world generator into a playable game. Because I'm just so creative like that, I named the hybrid of my two projects Blendcraft. If you're interested in my game engine project, I have two episodes up right now covering some of the functionality and development with more episodes to come. So let's take a look at some of the things you can do with Blendcraft. The basics are here, including keyboard and mouse input, allowing you to look and move around, and as you travel the world, terrain will load around you. The world is interactive as well. You can destroy the existing terrain and also place blocks of different types. There are a bunch of optional features for terrain generation, like world height, biome size, tree and grass frequency, caves, seeds, and more. So let's take a bird's eye view at some of the systems and how they work. I won't cover the game engine features like player movement, collision, or gravity, since I've already covered that in my game engine series. Links to those videos are in the description. And note that the keyboard and mouse input that Blendcraft uses hasn't been covered yet, but will be in a future episode. World Generator 2 was the base for this project, but almost all of the original nodes were reconfigured to work better with the game systems or to increase efficiency. Let's take a look at how the geometry node system is able to generate terrain. Here's a simplified version that first creates a two-dimensional grid of a set size. This grid creates the points that we can then put blocks on with an instance on points node. To give the grid some height, we can adjust it and move those duplicated points up on the z-axis only. The cool part here is the amount input, which we can use to add variation, thereby creating terrain. We can use a noise texture with some extra parameters on it to decide which points get duplicated by how much. Even with this simple setup, we have a ton of options for adjusting the terrain thanks to the input on the noise texture. If we set it to 4D, we get access to a W value that shuffles the noise around, acting like a terrain generation seed. The other sliders give us fine tuning on how big and how smooth our terrain is. And with this as a base, we can add a bunch of extra nodes to make biomes, put different types of blocks at different heights, and a bunch of other cool stuff. One of the coolest things I was able to add is the infinite scrolling that continuously loads additional terrain around your player's current position as you move. The whole world moves around your player so that you're always at the center of it, but to complete the effect, it also needs to scroll the terrain or you'd never seem to get anywhere. The vector input of the noise texture allows it to be moved by whatever position value we input. In this case, our player's position. Since we only want our grid to update in increments of one meter, using the snap math node allows the grid to be moved one meter at a time so that everything appears to be loading around you, but is actually scrolling the noise texture according to your position. This took some trial and error, as you can see from some of this footage of what went wrong during development. One of the most important features that just can't be missing is being able to place and delete blocks. So for this to happen, the system needs to know which blocks you want to delete or the position you want to place a block on. After a lot of experimenting, I ended up using a raycast and a sphere that's kind of squished vertically. The sphere lives in front of your camera and follows the rotation so that as you look around, 
It's hovering roughly inside of the block that you're looking at and positioned close to. The shape of this sphere selector was chosen to maximize the contact it makes with a single block while minimizing the chance of selecting more than one block at a time. Using a raycast, it can determine a hit and output as a selection. The selection can be plugged into an instance on points node along with the grid and uses an extra switch that only allows a block to be placed if the user input is true. Setting the material of this instance allows for different block types and putting this whole system into a simulation zone can iterate over the selection and keep the blocks that you place. Block deletion works pretty similarly to the block placement system, but with an extra step. When you delete a block, a plane is placed where you chose via the selection system, then a raycast deletes the blocks that any of those meshes are touching. There are technically two different block deletion systems, one for the existing terrain and one for the blocks that you place, but they work pretty similarly, although they are implemented in different spots. One of the biggest challenges I faced when working on Blendcraft was optimization. If you thought Minecraft was unoptimized, Blendcraft is even worse, and it's not even close. Optimizing geometry nodes is definitely an uphill battle, and there are a lot of cases with this project that sacrifice efficiency for functionality. With the original world generator system that this project is based on, the terrain takes some time to generate, but then it's good to go, and the frame rate runs well enough for even decently sized worlds. The caveat here is that any change that is made will need to load everything over again, and it could take several seconds. With Blendcraft, because things are always moving and the whole world's interactable, it's all basically being calculated every frame, and that slows things down a lot. It also uses quite a bit of memory. One of the issues with using geometry nodes is that you don't have direct access to lower level things like storing data a certain way or changing how things are loaded. I'm confident that with enough time and problem solving, things could be sped up quite a bit, but that's beyond the scope of this video. That being said, there are still a lot of things that I ended up doing to speed things up, the first of which is camera calling. So as you might imagine, rendering a bunch of blocks all at once, even when they can't be seen by the player, isn't a very efficient way to do things, which is why games have things like camera and occlusion calling. Camera calling uses vector math to figure out which objects your camera can see and which ones are outside of your vision, and then it doesn't worry about the ones that you can't see anyway. And implementing this in geometry nodes saves quite a bit of work for the computer and speeds things up a lot. Again, raycasts come to the rescue here, casting from each block toward the camera, and using the dot product allows the system to know if the camera is looking at a point, and then the non-visible points are deleted before any geometry is placed on them. Distance is another factor that matters, because by default the ray continues quite a distance behind the camera, making the blocks behind you in that ray visible so the system dynamically calculates the length of the ray per block from the block to the camera to prevent this from happening. Collision is another area that can be optimized. If the raycast that detects collision has to measure to each block, it's a really inefficient process and completely unnecessary for the vast majority of blocks because the player can only collide with a few blocks that are in close proximity at any given time. So for this reason, I have two separate sets of geometry, one for all the visual blocks and another much smaller set for the blocks within three meters that the player could collide with. Here you can see the texture blocks representing the blocks that can be collided with and the blank blocks are just visual and can't be collided with unless the player moves closer. This allows for much faster frame rates because the player collision raycast only needs to worry about a handful of blocks at a time. I did make attempts to implement proper occlusion calling, which doesn't render objects that are hidden behind other objects relative to the camera's view. Minecraft does this, which saves the computer so much work because most of the blocks in the world aren't visible at any given time because they're hidden behind other blocks. I couldn't get the calling system quite right, so I ended up adding a block neighbor system instead, which uses a simple rule to determine if a block has the possibility of being visible. If the block has six neighbors, 
then it's obscured on every side by other blocks, so it shouldn't be rendered. This does function, and it removes a significant number of instances, and theoretically it speeds things up a lot, but because it needs to calculate every frame, it actually takes more time to calculate than it saves in rendering, so it's a net loss in FPS. So in conclusion, this is more of a tech demo than anything else in its current state. Until things are optimized quite a bit, it's usually only stable enough to play for a little bit before it crashes, but I did achieve my goal of making it playable. The cool thing here is that with enough time, I can totally see a ton more core features being feasible with geometry nodes, like inventory systems, damage, more detailed terrain, crafting, and things like that. Some things like mob behavior and save data are a bit more tricky, but with creative solutions, I think those could be added as well. Projects like these are what make games like Minecraft and software like Blender so fun in the first place, because the joy of creating something and pushing through the challenges that get in your way is just so much fun. Anyway, as always, the project files are up on my Patreon, and you can get the original versions of the World Builder projects for free with the links below. Thanks so much for watching my video, and I will see you next time.